given many talks and written on Our Lady of Guadalupe, but this is the first lecture I've ever given on, on Juan Diego. So we have a long introduction today. So I think it's very important that we start with thinking about just how powerful the tradition of Guadalupe and Juan Diego is. I presume most of you know the story. In 1531, the indigenous neophyte Juan Diego heard beautiful music on the hill of Tepeyac. Ascending it, he saw Our Lady of Guadalupe, who sent him to the first bishop of Mexico, Juan de Sumarraga, asking that he build a chapel, a temple, on that site of Tepeyac where she appeared. At first, the bishop didn't believe, but after several goings back and forth, eventually he does. In the midst of all this, she also healed Juan Diego's uncle, Juan Bernardino. It's a very popular story. I suppose most of you know those the basic lines of it. Uh, maybe you don't know, Guadalupe, her shrine in Mexico City, is the most visited pilgrimage site of any religion in the Western Hemisphere. This is a very powerful kinetic devotion. Her image, the image of Guadalupe, is the most imprinted, re reprinted religious icon other than Jesus of Nazareth in the entire hemisphere. So it's a very powerful thing, this devotion to Guadalupe. And I want to just emphasize that even more by showing you a little video. This video is of the Antorcha Guadalupana, which means the Guadalupe torch run. It's kind of like a relay race, but it's a devotional relay race. For 15 years, starting in 2000, this uh, relay started in Mexico City at the Basilica, went throughout Mexico to Matamoros, crossed into Brownsville, Texas, up through Texas in the southeast, past the White House, and ended up on the steps of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York in time for the Guadalupe Feast. It took three months to do this, 3,000 miles. So one person handing on the torch to the other. Uh, the torch run was done to plea for Guadalupe's assistance for immigrants. Uh, we'll see if there's a post-COVID reality to this torch run but it was done for many, many years. And I just want you to look at some images, which you're going to see now are people doing this torch run from Mexico City all the way to New York, just to give you a sense of how powerful this devotion is in the lives of people. So friends, we begin with the most important point. This is something very powerful in the lives of people. Uh, we're not just talking about another saint. We're talking about something that's very deep in a culture, in a spirituality, in a people. As my dear friend and mentor Virgilio Elizondo said, and as this uh, video clearly shows, Guadalupe is not powerful because of what we theologians write about her. She is powerful because she lives in the hearts and the minds of people, millions of people. What is it about Guadalupe that draws so many millions into intimate relationship with her? What has made her so powerful over the past 500 years and in the lives of her daughters and her sons today? These are the questions that have inspired theologians, artists, poets, preachers, and others who examined Guadalupe down through the centuries. Of course, the relationship between Guadalupe and Juan Diego is certainly at the heart of these questions, since he is the first person in whose life she had such power. So this morning, I will reflect on Juan Diego, Saint Juan Diego, and on his relationship with Guadalupe. My talk is organized around four major themes, presented both thematically and in order of their chronological development. Today, many see Juan Diego as a kind of a mythical figure, a symbolic representation of the conquered natives of the Americas. Uh, we'll get to talk about those pre uh, uh, perceptions in just a moment. But we begin with the actual historical person, Juan Diego, and how his colonial contemporaries viewed him both the missionaries, how they viewed him, and the natives themselves, how he viewed him. So, we're going to be four points. The first is Juan Diego in this early hagiography. And what you see here is a portrait by Miguel Cabrera from the 18th century. It's called Verdadero Retrato de Venerable Juan Diego, the true portrait of the Venerable Juan Diego. It's the first known portrait of Juan Diego. And as you can see here, the birds are circling around him. That's the beautiful music that called him to the top of the hill. Guadalupe is at the top of the hill. And he's depicted as kind of a pilgrim. He's got staff in hand and hat. This was the earliest saintly image of Juan Diego. It was the one used in the canonization of Pope John Paul II, which I'll get to in a moment. Notice, however, that he's depicted with very European features. He's not so much an indigenous man. He looks a little bit more European uh, with beard and so on in the way he looks. 
So the first treatise ever written to focus on Guadalupe and the evangelization of natives, specifically the Nahuas, or the Aztecs of central Mexico, Juan Diego was one of them. The first such treatise was Father Luis Lazo de la Vega's uh, book, Hui Tuamacultica of 1649. Hui Tuamacultica means literally, by a great miracle. And the full translated title of this Nahuatl work is, By a great miracle appeared the heavenly queen, Saint Mary, our precious mother of Guadalupe, here near the great Altepetl, uh, the hill of Mexico, at a place called Tepeyac. The vicar of the Guadalupe Sanctuary at the time his pastoral manual was published, Father Lazo de la Vega presented an idealized portrait of Juan Diego in order to enhance Nahua conformity to Catholic norms and to colonial officials' expectations of proper native subjects. So this is a manual for other priests. How do you convince the native peoples to become better Catholics? And Juan Diego was one of the images used in the book, of course. His writing is clearly rooted in Eurocentric presumptions with the intent of persuading native peoples to abandon their pre-conquest religion and embrace the Catholic faith wholeheartedly. Thus, Hui Tuamacultica must be understood within the context of the larger Spanish project to convert the natives into practitioners of the missionaries' ideals of faithful Catholics. Emphasis on Juan Diego as a model of faithfulness is a central motif of the Nikan Mopoa. The Nikan Mopoa is one part of this book. It means here is related. It's the Nahuatl account of the apparitions. It's the most sacred text in the Guadalupe tradition, the Nahuatl account of Our Lady of Guadalupe's encounters with Juan Diego. Uh, this is true of the Nikan Mapoa then. Juan Diego was a model of faithfulness as it is of the entire book, the Hui Tuamacultica. In narrative details and thrust, the Nikan Mapoa presents Juan Diego as an exemplar of a faithful uh, believer's response to divine revelation and to Guadalupe's maternal care. For example, the enchantment Lazo de la Vega wanted devotees to feel in the presence of the Guadalupe image is modeled in the depiction of Juan Diego when his eyes first beheld the beauty of her countenance and its transformative effect on the landscape around her. So here's kind of a long quote from the Nikan Mapoa. When Juan Diego came before her, this is his first time he sees her, he greatly marveled at how she completely surpassed everything in her total splendor. Her clothes were like the sun in the way they gleamed and shone. Her resplendence struck the stones and boulders by which she stood, so that they seemed like precious emeralds and jeweled bracelets. The ground sparkled like a rainbow, and the mesquite, the prickly pear cactus, and other various kinds of weeds that grow there seemed like green obsidian, and their foliage like fine turquoise. Their stalks, their thorns, and spines gleamed like gold. Huey Tuamacultica also contains a short treatment of Juan Diego's life. This is the first published synopsis of Juan Diego's life, which Lazo de la Vega posed as a prototype of the ideal Nahua indigenous response to the many marvels of Guadalupe. It is not clear if Lazo de la Vega intended to do so, but his hagiographic sketch portrayed Juan Diego like a mo model Franciscan lay brother or a lay person living a consecrated life. After his encounters with Guadalupe, Juan Diego, quote, dedicated himself entirely to the heavenly lady as his patron. He served as caretaker of the Guadalupe image and the shrine, where he spent the remainder of his days in prayer, fasting, penance, solitude, and with frequent reception of confession and communion. The account even claimed that, though married to a woman named Maria Lucia, who died two years before the apparitions, Juan Diego remained a chaste virgin throughout his life in response to a sermon of Fray Turibio de Benavente, one of the original Franciscan 12 apostles to Mexico, who is also known as Motolenia, the poor one. Hui Tuamacultica's description of Juan Diego's death related a comforting vision of Guadalupe in which she welcomed him into the joys of heaven. Thus, Lazo de la Vega claimed Juan Diego not only for his holy life, but also for his holy death. Lazo de la Vega's catechetical purpose in Hui Tamacultica was acutely manifest in the concluding invocation of his exposition about Juan Diego's saintly life. He said, quote, may it be her, Guadalupe's, wish 
that we too may serve and abandon all the worldly things that lead us astray so that we too may attain the eternal riches of heaven. La Soledad Vega's presentation of Juan Diego as a model of saintliness initiated an engagement of Juan Diego that subsequent pastors and devotees emulated. Though systematic treatments of Juan Diego's life did not emerge until the early 20th century, in time, subsequent writers and preachers followed La Soledad Vega in expounding the evangelical virtues of Juan Diego, especially as a means to entice native peoples and other devotees to imitate his sanctity. Well, let's go to a second point. That's how the missionaries talked about Juan Diego. How did the Indians think about Juan Diego? That's part two. What you see here is a, an image from the 18th century, but this became very popular in the 17th century to depict Juan Diego with Guadalupe together and to, to show his intimate relationship with her and that through his connections, as we'll see, the natives began to see her, to see him as someone who could pray for their needs before God. Now, here's the important point in part two. The missionaries preached uh, Juan Diego as a model of saintliness. The natives themselves said, Juan Diego is one of us, and he's a very close friend to Our Lady, as you can see in this image, and he can take our prayers to her. So this did not come from the priests. It came from the natives, the idea of Juan Diego as intercessor before Our Lady. Guadalupe began as a paradoxical figure for indigenous devotees. She was a force whom Spaniards engaged to enhance native people's acceptance of colonial rule and missionary efforts, an instrument of the Spanish efforts to displace indigenous ways. But she was also a powerful mother and intercessor, a brown-skinned woman who provided continuity with an ancient Nahua worship site at Tepeyac. She reportedly worked miracles that alleviated suffering in indigenous communities amidst the catastrophic, effect, catastrophic effects of European diseases. Millions of people died from the European diseases. So they looked to her and Juan Diego's intercession for healing. Thus, it is not surprising that natives participated in the Guadalupan devotion from the earliest stages of its evolution. Indeed, natives were the first Guadalupan devotees with an explicit intercessory devotion to Juan Diego. The first official initiative to gather testimony about the Guadalupe tradition revealed that a native named Juan Diego had lived among those in the indigenous community around Tepeyac and prayed with his fellow devotees at the Guadalupe shrine there. When the cathedral chapter of Mexico City sought papal promulgation of a Guadalupe feast day, they conducted an inquiry into the Guadalupe tradition to bolster their case with Vatican officials. Though ultimately unsuccessful in achieving the goal of papal recognition for their Guadalupan patroness, that, that happened a century later, the Pope gave that a century later, but not this time. The 1665-1666 investigation provided testimonies from 20 witnesses. We, we still have these testimonies. 12 of the witnesses were Spaniards or Criollos, that is persons of Spanish blood born in the New World, who were interviewed in Mexico City. Eight others, were residents of Cuauhtitlan, the place traditionally considered Juan Diego's hometown. Seven of the Cuauhtitlan interviewees were Nahuas, natives, who gave their testimony through a Nahuatl Spanish interpreter. The other one was a mestizo, a mixed race person of Spanish and indigenous descent. Now, most historians have discarded or discounted these testimonies because of the way they were done. Priests, asked these native peoples these questions, and they did it this way. The questions sometimes would be two or three pages long. Are you aware that Juan Diego one day was walking around the hill of Tepeyac and he heard music and he went to the top of the hill and the Virgin talked to him and, and they gave him the whole story and the native's answer was yes. <laughs> so it looks like they were just led into the answers. And so many historians have said, well, that, that's not really good historical recommendation. And they're right. They were saying what they thought the priests wanted them to say and they were given the answers in advance and they just said yes. But what I did in my research is I went back through all 20 of these hundreds of pages of documentation and I underlined everything anyone said that wasn't contained in the questions. Because what the natives often did, much more than the Spaniards who were interviewed, they would say, oh yes, oh and let me tell you something else. And then they would add other things that weren't in the questions. 
So historically, what's most interesting here is, what did those now was say that wasn't given to them in the questions? And that's what I'm going to tell you about now. Are you excited? <laughs> <laughs> Consequently, the most useful information from the inquiry is contained in statements that go beyond what the interviewers specified or implied in their questions. In this regard, the fifth of the nine questions is particularly important for understanding the engagement of Juan Diego in native communities. It addressed Juan Diego's life and virtues, a crucial consideration since the holiness of someone who had allegedly experienced an apparition is one sign or a countersign of the apparition's validity. All 20 witnesses affirm Juan Diego's integrity. In the words of the question they were asked, they stated he was indeed a good Christian, un buen cristiano. But the responses of the Mexico City witnesses tended to merely affirm a general tradition of Juan Diego's virtu virtuous reputation, while those of the Coahuititlan witnesses, the native peoples, affirmed various further details about Juan Diego and expounded on what was asked in the questions. Multiple Coahuititlan witnesses attest, for instance, that an aged picture in a room at their local parish church depicted Juan Diego, his uncle Juan Bernardino, who Guadalupe had healed, and Franciscan missionary Fray Pedro de Gante, famous for his very enculturated ministry among native peoples. Another distinguishing feature of the Coahuititlan respondents, who according to the inquiry, uh, ranged in age from 78 to over 100 years old, and were nearly all older than the Mexico City interview, interviewees. They had a longer lived history of the devotion, in other words. Uh, one of the most, uh, all of them recounted uh, something that was not in the questions, how their parents, their grandparents, their aunts, their neighbors, all knew Juan Diego personally and told them about him. So they were handing on this oral traditions. The most unique feature of the Coahuititlan testimonies was statements about the veneration of Juan Diego himself. Marcos Pacheco, one of those witnesses, recalled his aunt's frequent plea that, quote, God would do to you and your brothers what he did to Juan Diego. What a wonderful uh, aunt that is. But may God do to you what she did to Juan Diego. I can, hear, I can hear my own mother saying the same thing. Echoing an affirmation conveyed in the prior book of Las Vela Vega and another book of Father Miguel Sanchez and mentioned in the various interviews uh, from the official inquiry, Gabriel Sanchez stated his parents told him Juan Diego resided and served as the Guadalupe Chapel after the apparitions. But he also added further observations. He said Juan Diego was known among locals as El Peregrino, the pilgrim because of his frequent journeys to the Franciscan mission station at Tlatoleco to receive religious instruction. After he encountered Guadalupe and took up residence at Tepeyac, natives often visited him there, quote, to ask that he intercede for them with the most holy version to give them seasons, harvests, in their maize fields. The absence of references to existing Juan Diego devotion in other sources including the previous books of Sanchez and Lazo de la Vega, as, as well as the Mexico City witnesses in the official inquiry, reveals that native witnesses spoke of a devotion to Juan Diego generated among themselves in their own communities, not one borrowed from the Spanish or Criollo informants. It is not surprising, of course, that indigenous devotees were the first to venerate the unanticipated hero Juan Diego both because Juan Diego was one of their own and because most Spaniards and Criollos did not tend to hold the natives in very high regard. As a number of commentators have observed, at its core, the apparition story is neither about Criollo election nor about Spanish election, but about Guadalupe's providential choosing of an indigenous neophyte as her emissary. Thus, natives not only participated in the development of the Guadalupe tradition as it evolved during the 16th and early 17th centuries, but were also the first to articulate their trust in Juan Diego as an intercessor. Admiration of Juan Diego's faith and courage animated the lives of fellow natives who endured colonial subjugation in most wonderful ways. So now we're jumping several centuries. Uh, 
Pope John Paul II, of course, is the one who beatified and canonized Juan Diego. And in his homilies for those occasions, he brings together both points one and two that I mentioned. Juan Diego is an example of holiness, an evangelizer, and as an intercessor, as an emissary. In 1979, one of St. Pope John Paul II's initial acts on his first of five papal visits to Mexico that he made was to celebrate the Eucharist at the massive new Guadalupe Basilica, which had been dedicated three years earlier. He was the first pope to visit Mexico and to celebrate the Eucharist at Tepeyac, the, the site of the Guadalupe Basilica. The teaching of John Paul II underscores the link between Guadalupe, Juan Diego, and the evangelization of persons, cultures, and societies. Of course, what John Paul called the new evangelization. John Paul's ardent Marian and Guadalupean piety is reflected in the fact that he made more pronouncements on Guadalupe than any other pope. In 1999, he formally presented the apostolic exhortation Ecclesia in America during a Eucharist at the Guadalupe Basilica, and he presented it to Guadalupe. John Paul's 1990 and 2002 trips to Mexico included the celebration of the beatification and canonization of Juan Diego, respectively. Of course, 2002 was his emotional final visit to Mexico, which he was determined to do before he died, to personally canonize Juan Diego in Mexico. And we're still on point three. Uh, Pope John Paul called Juan Diego the evangelizer of the Americas and deeply rooted his life in this call to evangelization. So what I'm going to give you now is just a summary of the homilies that John Paul gave for the beatification in 1990 and the canonization in 2002. At the beatification and canonization, John Paul confirmed devotees' esteem for Juan Diego as, quote, the first indigenous Native American saint of the American continent. On both occasions, the Pope accentuated Juan Diego as Guadalupe's companion in evangelization. In the early stages of the proclamation of the gospel in Mexico, Juan Diego participated in the Guadalupean process of, according to the Pope, quote, a perfectly enculturated evangelization. For, quote, in accepting the Christian message without foregoing his indigenous identity, Juan Diego discovered the profound truth of the new humanity in which we are all called to be children of God. Today, Juan Diego's testimony issues, another quote, a strong call to all the lay faithful, the lay faithful of the nation, to assume all their responsibilities in the transmission of the gospel message and in the witness of a living and operative faith in Mexican society. This includes the laity confronting, quote, poverty, corruption, contempt for truth, and for human rights. Accentuating the ongoing plight of natives and other marginalized peoples, John Paul presented Juan Diego as their protector and an inspiration in their struggles. Juan Diego exemplifies the evangelizing vocation of the laity, which encompasses their mandate to accompany and uplift the poor and the marginalized. They are called not only to be the recipients of evangelization, but to be the Juan Diegos of today and take up the task of evangelizing one another, as well as the task of evangelizing society. All are called to evangelize through emulating the holiness of St. Juan Diego, which John Paul portrayed as shining forth through trust in God and trust in Guadalupe, humility, charity, moral integrity, and simplicity of life. Summarizing his teaching on Juan Diego, John Paul ended his canonization homily asking the indigenous saint to, quote, accompany the church on her pilgrimage in Mexico so that she may be more evangelizing and more missionary each day and imbue every area of social life with the spirit of the gospel. And now back to a, a, to a topic that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, here you see another... Uh, older image, a 17th century one. In the 17th century, it began the custom of not just depicting Guadalupe, her image, but if you see on the borders of this, the apparition scenes. And so the idea of depicting her surrounded by the apparition scenes, which draws attention to the fact that we can't understand Guadalupe in isolation from Juan Diego. And we can't understand Juan Diego in isolation from Guadalupe. It's Guadalupe and Juan Diego in partnership that make the Guadalupe tradition. 
And that image shows this, and I want to talk to you now about a theological understanding of Guadalupe that has emphasized the Guadalupe Juan Diego encounter even more as another way of thinking about Juan Diego's holiness and the Guadalupe tradition. So one of the most widespread interpretations of the Guadalupe event in more recent times is that it is a counter narrative to the subjugation of the natives and other marginalized peoples. A claim usually rooted in the attempt to examine the Nikan Mapoa, the apparition's account, uh, within the context of the Nahua language and the social and cultural milieu of the colonial era. Reflections of this sort often delve more deeply into Juan Diego's partnership with Guadalupe in upsetting the norms of colonial society. The hermeneutical key to the Guadalupe tradition, according to this perspective, is to examine the dynamics of the Guadalupe Juan Diego encounter and their relationship. The most frequently enunciated theme in these interpretations is justice or liberation, the breaking in of God's reign that upends the status quo of this world. Proponents of this perspective note the significance of Guadalupe's first words to Juan Diego, quote, her first words, Dear Juan, dear Juan Diego. Contrary to the Spanish conquerors and even some of the missioners, Guadalupe does not address Juan Diego in a generic or a derogatory way. Rather, she calls him by name. She offers a tender greeting, communicating her inner attitude of respect and esteem. She then goes on to give him the mission of communicating to Bishop Sumaraga her desire that a temple be built on the hill of Tepeyac. Her words of comfort and calling are given effect in the narrative's dramatic reversals. The Nikon is kind of like the, the Gospel of Luke. There's all these dramatic reversals of place that carry their way through the narrative. For example, um, at the beginning of the story, only Guadalupe has trust in Juan Diego. By the end, the bishop and his assistants believe he is truly her messenger. At the outset of the account, Juan Diego kneels before the bishop. In the end, the stooped indio stands erect, while the bishop and his household, household kneel before him as they venerate the tilma that he's holding up. Throughout the account, Juan Diego must journey to the center of the city from Tepeyac, some three miles to the north on the outskirts. At the end of the narration, the bishop and his entourage accompany Juan Diego to the periphery of Tepeyac, where they will build the temple that Guadalupe requested. Symbolically, and indeed physically, the presence of the ecclesial leadership in the church they are constructing are thus moved from the center of their capital city out to the margins among the indigenous people. Thus, Guadalupe and Juan Diego reveal a new vision, one in which the lowly are entrusted with a mission and the powerful are instructed to accompany them. Guadalupe, in other words, manifests God's preferential love for the poor and the transformation in church of church and society that such a love of preference demands. Juan Diego, was, of course, is central to this reimagining of the social order. Clodomiro Sierra Cunha, a Mexican priest with extensive pastoral experience among indigenous peoples, contends that, quote, the poor peasant Juan Diego is, in the Nican Mapoa, the key that initiated and made comprehensible the event of Tepeyac. Moreover, in this sacred text, Juan Diego speaks, quote, the theology of the poor. Seeking to understand the presence of God among his people, Juan Diego acts out of a conviction that, quote, the difficulties of the poor are the difficulties of God. While Guadalupe asks for a temple where she can show her love and compassion to the marginal and to all peoples, in serving as her messenger, Juan Diego implicitly asks in her name for a new society in which the poor will be believed and respected as Guadalupe is believed and respected. Thus, Juan Diego models the poor as protagonists for transforming divisive social codes. Sierra Cunha repeatedly accentuates that no one can claim to love Our Lady Guadalupe unless we also love the poor embodied in her chosen emissary, Juan Diego. We cannot love Our Lady Guadalupe unless we love the poor one, Juan Diego. 
Sierra Cunha laments that in Guadalupe pastoral initiatives and devotion, quote, everything is centered on the image, on the devotion, even though, quote, the Virgin had placed her message and her promise and her intention apart from herself in the service of the poor natives. He poignantly concludes that, quote, the image separated from a commitment with the poor has no Guadalupe significance. These are radical claims. Yet Sierra Cunha insists that no matter what their contestations to the contrary, those who are not actively involved in the struggle to transform injustices are not true devotees of their mother Guadalupe. We cannot profess to love Our Lady Guadalupe unless we love her chosen son, the poor one, Juan Diego. And a few concluding reflections. Uh, this is one of my favorite images. This is drawn by a, an artist from Los Angeles, a Korean artist. Her name is Catherine Kwan. And it's, it's the Korean Juan Diego in Guadalupe. You can see the features there. They're depicted as Korean persons. Um, and it's just kind of a reminder and an announcement that Guadalupe is from Mexico, but the story and the image and the meaning of Guadalupe is for everybody. It's for the whole church. It's for the whole world. Liberationist interpretations of the Guadalupe tradition underscore the dramatic tension that drives the Nikan Mapoa apparitions account, particularly the skepticism of Bishop Juan de Zumarraga and his assistants, and Juan Diego's corresponding perseverance despite self-doubt. On his first visit to the bishop's residence to relate Guadalupe's message and her desire that a temple be built in her honor, Juan Diego was kept waiting a long time and in the end, he was dismissed with suspicion. Distraught, he returned immediately to Tepeyac to plead that Guadalupe, quote, entrust one of the higher nobles who are recognized, respected, and honored to carry and take your message so that he will be believed, for I am but a poor, ordinary man. In one of the most moving passages of the Nican Mapoa, Guadalupe responds to Juan Diego's doubt and his request that she, she get someone else for the job. And she says these beautiful words. Know well in your heart that there are not a few of my servants and messengers to whom I could give the mandate of taking my thought and my word so that my will may be accomplished. But it is absolutely necessary that you personally go and speak about this and that precisely through your mediation and help, my wish and my desire be realized. Juan Diego had internalized the effects of the conquest and subjugation. This is not unusual, of course. Often the worst chains around the enslaved and the conquered are not the chains around the legs. It's the change inside the head and the heart, the internalization of, I am not worthy. I'm not as good as the others. I'm not capable. And Juan Diego, in this text, apparently that's the way he was feeling about himself. But Guadalupe insisted, you are the one that must accomplish my purposes. In doing so, she enabled Juan Diego to know in his own flesh the essential gospel truth of his own human dignity. And she exposed to him the lie of social inequities and experiences that diminished his fundamental sense of worth. She taught Juan Diego, and she teaches us, that no matter how put down you are, no matter where you come from, you are somebody. You matter. Everybody matters. It must be you. This is the call of Guadalupe to Juan Diego. It is your call to all the conquered, enslaved, rejected, and marginalized persons of the American continent. It is her call to every single one of us. It must be you. Juan Diego is an American saint because he embodies so deeply what it means to live as a disciple and as a saint in this place that was born of conquest and is still plagued with racism and inequity today. Juan Diego is a saint because his story of faith and resilience is the story of America. Let me conclude these reflections with the thoughts of Pope Francis, the first pope from the American hemisphere who visited Mexico and the Guadalupe Shrine at Tepeyac in February 2016. His homily compared Mary of Nazareth's encounter with her cousin Elizabeth in the visitation 
to the encounter between Mary of Guadalupe and Juan Diego. Quote, just as she went along the paths of Judea and Galilee, in the same way she walked through Tepeyac, the Holy Father proclaimed. As Mary had made her visitation to Elizabeth centuries before, so too she, quit, she, quote, wished also to come to the inhabitants of these American lands through the person of the Indian, St. Juan Diego. Pope Francis then went on to meditate at some length on the purposes of God in the Guadalupe encounter. So this is kind of a longer quote. On that morning, at that meeting, God awakened the hope of his son Juan and the hope of a people. On that morning, God roused the hope of the little ones, of the suffering, of those displaced or rejected, of all who feel they have no worthy place in these lands. On that morning, God came close, and he still comes close, to the suffering but resilient hearts of so many mothers, fathers, grandparents, who have seen their children leaving, becoming lost, or even being taken by criminals. On that morning, Juancito experienced in his own life what hope is, what the mercy of God is, end quote. The Pope explained that the preferential love offered to Juan Diego and all the downtrodden was, quote, not against anyone, but rather in favor of everyone. He urged his hearers to realize that in, quote, in visiting this shrine, the same things that happened to Juan Diego can also happen to us. In the name of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Pope Francis commissioned his hearers that day and commissioned all of us to be the Juan Diegos of today. Again, a quote from Pope Francis. Today, Guadalupe sends us out anew, as she did Juancito. Today, she comes to tell us again, be my ambassador, the one I send to build many shrines, accompany many lives, and wipe away many tears. Go and build my shrine. Help me to lift up the lives of my sons and my daughters who are your brothers and sisters. Like Our Lady of Guadalupe, Pope Francis insists, it must be you. God grant us the grace to be the Juan Diegos of our day today. Thank you.